It's a huge honor to stand here and share some reflections with you. Um, I have entitled this talk, CMC, The College of My Dreams. I want to start by saying thank you. I want to say thank you to God because um, even though I may not be repeating it, you will recognize um, his hand and his finger guiding, uh, guiding me and all the members of my family every step of the way. Sometimes his guidance wasn't obvious, but when I look back, I can see that one can join the dots and discern God's hand and his caring love for each one of us. The second thing that I, I want to, uh, second set of thanks I want to express is to each one of you. You are CMC and uh, to a huge extent I am what I am today because of this college and I want to thank every member of this college. I have always maintained of course that CMC is not a geographical location. Uh, it's an idea, but this idea is carried in the hearts and souls of many, many of you. And each of you has influenced and more than me. And I want to express my deepest gratitude, especially, of course, today to our principal, uh, Alfie, and our director, Sunil, and all the other members of the CMC administration and the CMC council. I also want to take a few minutes to thank my family. It's very uh, awkward to do this properly, but I particularly want to mention um, my father and my father-in-law, two giants in my life who are no more, but uh, whose imprint um, has uh, molded me very, very deeply and creatively. I also want to mention my um, uncle, Bishop Chris Austin. He's a mere 95 years old, uh, which means that half of you would not have been born when he was uh, made bishop. He's uh, put on a special dress uh, to come and be in our midst. He can't speak English and Malayalam, he can only speak Arabic and Jordan. <laughs> but you can see at 95, you can have a heart and a soul of two years old. And uh, I've learned so much from him that, uh, you know, and, and this would take too long if I went into all the wonderful things that I've learned from him. Um, since this is an academic sort of exercise for medical students, I thought I would restrict myself to what has happened to me uh, after 1970 when I came here. But I must take a few minutes to express my deep gratitude to all my teachers. Um, you know, beginning with my parents, of course, and my grandmother, who herself was a teacher. Um, I went to a school in a small railway town called Ada. Uh, it was called the Railway Mixed Middle School. Uh, I can still picture those red brick buildings and the enormous opportunity for learning uh, that we all had there. We had very little of what uh, today we would call infrastructure. But what we lacked in infrastructure uh, was completely made up by the love and the care of our teachers. Um, you know, with scraps of paper and blades of grass, they expounded um, what was truly um, infinite and uh, eternal to us. And um, it's a foundation on which um, the lives of uh, our entire Family. I have four brothers, we have, we have four brothers and sisters. Uh, we all have most happy uh, memories of our time in school. Um, we lived in a small town. I had to go to high school in a, in a city in Jamshedpur. And as Alfie said, I always claim that I am a Bihar because I think that Bihar uh, had universities and uh, was the center of learning in our country when the rest of the world was still running around with bare skins. Um, and I'm told that when the Nalanda library was, was burnt, uh, the, there were so many books there that the fires didn't go on for a month. Because sadly, um, the learning seemed to have dissipated and uh, Bihar isn't as grand as it was, 
but it's, it's really getting there. Uh, so when you crack jokes about Bihar, please be careful because you're stepping on my toes. Uh, now, from Bihar, I came straight to CMC. Um, and, you know, I had read in, from the British Council Library the Dorothy Clark Wilson books. And um, I was really, really inspired. And I thought it would be a huge privilege to get into such a, a famous and large college. A CMC. Um, I had been introduced to it by my parish priest, uh, Reverend Mike Norton, who, who is head of the college. Uh, he happened to be the classmate of Dr. J. H. G. Ware, who was the then director of CMC. And uh, Anne, who is sitting here, Anne and Ryan, Dr. Ware, and Reverend Mike Norton were all a part of a fraternity called the CMS, or the Church Missionary Society. Um, a group of really wonderful people. And so Reverend McNaughton um, sent me back a letter. And so I was sponsored by the Church Missionary Society. And I'll tell you a little bit about uh, the linkages with CMS a little later. Um, I, you know, the, even the coming here seemed to be so potential. A telegram was sent to inform me that I had been selected for the interviews. Um, the tests went off OK. You know, in, in Calcutta and in West Bengal, strikes and hartals are common. So one never can be certain that the exams will be held or one will make it. We had gone for a holiday to Diga, which is a beach town close to uh, West Bengal, to Calcutta. And from there, I wrote the exams. And then, um, you know, the, the usual time when it didn't call would come when passed, and I thought, OK, I haven't made it. And uh, then suddenly, a telegram uh, appeared, and we had to actually leave home immediately. Um, my father was on duty, he was a guard in the Indian Railways, he came home and uh, we showed him the letter and said, right, he exchanged his duty, like many of us now, you know, when we had a sudden need to take leave, and we set out in a taxi to Jamshedpur, jumped onto an unreserved train, an unreserved compartment, came up to Walter, where some of his friends gave us lunch and then pushed us into a second class compartment to, on the train to come to Chennai. But in Chennai, um, things suddenly changed. My dad, we were the railway, so we had a first class pass, went to um, check for reservations on the Vrindavan Express. And sure, there were reservations available. We got seats number, I think, 10, 11, 11 uh, 9, 10, 11, 12, or 9, 10, 11. And guess who was sitting in seats 1 to 6? Mr. Karnani, the the chief minister of our state. That's how they travelled in those days. Uh, he was in, in the first six seats, he and his uh, colleagues. He gently went up to the door and made a little speech, waved goodbye. And of course, I was in awe of this uh, the chief minister of the state. So we travelled in the same compartment and um, we arrived in, in Karpati. Um, and we were met by a whole busload of medical students. Um, because at that time, I didn't know that somewhere in disguise, there was one young lady, I think she was Usha. I, I knew she was Usha. But uh, she was um, you know, very loudly protesting that the boys were sitting next to her. And she didn't want me, uh, the boy to be sitting next to her because her grandmother had told her not to sit next to the boys. Of course, Swarani was completely taken in. I thought maybe I should tell her that uh, she's come for an interview to a college and she should uh, you know, be willing to sit next to next to boys, etc. And uh, we came to a men's hostel and um, you know, we were met by a posse of uh, coolies who offered to take our bedding, our trunks, and uh, up they ran. And I was wondering how you know, we could have uh, so many uh, you know, people available to take our trunks and beddings in the hostel. Um, the amazing thing was, of course, we later on learned that these are all our uh, seniors. Um, one senior with whom I stayed, uh, Dr. Uh, Tharian Tharian, sweetly and kindly gave me his bed. He slept on the floor, and as an interview candidate, I slept on his bed. Um, these are just some examples of the enormous kindness that I encountered as soon as I came here. And I couldn't, uh, I couldn't believe it. Um, of course, I survived the interviews. Um, I think I slightly shocked my group observers because I had grown up in a, in a very Catholic school 
where I learned to say the mass in, in Latin. And uh, so uh, they must have, I, I figured that they must have been quite astonished at, uh, at the very Catholic, uh, very good Catholic uh, theological evenings that I had. Nevertheless, um, I really enjoyed my interviews. They, they asked questions and uh, laughed at my jokes. And uh, um, we also had a free day in between when uh, reports were written. And I have great memories of going to the fort and then going, being shown around the, the hospital. Now, we were taken to the mortuary um, and we were told that they would show us a cadaver. The cadaver had been retrieved from Tumba, which was, uh, which our seniors claimed was a rape, and there had been a, an atomic accident and this cadaver was completely radioactive. So, to save us medical students from this radioactivity, they made us put powder <laughs> on all our faces. And they said, your ears are not covered, please put enough powder there. So there we were you know, putting powder on all our faces. And then we were marched into first, then they said, you can't go directly from this powder room to the mortuary. You have to first go through the whole hospital. So, <laughs> so we were marched to the whole hospital with this powder on our faces. Everybody knew who were the new medical students. <laughs> and uh, so, yeah, and the cadaver was laid out, and uh, we put a little uh, a card on his, on his toe. The card said, Porus Navar. Now, Porus happened to be from my school, Royal School in Jamshed Porus, so I was a bit puzzled. But anyway, uh, you know, we were regaled with all the, uh, his exploits as a nuclear scientist. And then, at the appropriate moment, of course, this cadaver uh, rose up, and then you know, medical students fainted, uh, and all went fine. And such was our introduction to, to CMC. Uh, I know that uh, the current rules don't allow that uh, medical to be introduced to medicine in this way. But uh, you can see that I really, really enjoyed myself, and I do sometimes wish that progress wasn't so fast and so different. Um, I, you know, think that CMC is a college of my dreams because I learned two, two lessons here. And, you know, it doesn't matter if uh, you don't remember anything else this evening, but what I would like you to, like the medical students remember, are the two things that I learned in CMC. I learned to learn, and I learned to love. The, the, the medicine, of course, you know, uh, I have a huge list of wonderful teachers. But let me first start with my own friends. When I came to medical college, in our school, it was an absolutely fabulous school. I can't uh, speak highly enough of it. You know, we were too poor to have the standard uh, chemical balances. So Father Kirsch had rigged up balances that were basically beams of light. There was a jam tin with a hole in it and a light bulb in a dark room. And that created a beam of light that went to a little mirror which was stuck on a meter ruler, which was suspended from the ceiling. So uh, this beam of light would hit that mirror and go back to the wall. There was a paper stuck on the wall. And uh, since that beam was, was supported from the ceiling, we had little pads which we could actually uh, put weights on and we could calculate the moment uh, of that fan because the meter ruler gave us the distances. So with this, we could get weights to the third decimal place easily. And uh, you know, we we didn't we couldn't afford ammeters and volt meters. So he just got lots of uh, galvan meters, and we uh, attached resistors in series and in parallel, and we made our own ohmmeters, made our own galvan meters. And, uh, and you know, in school, uh, we had made our first photoelectric relay. We had repeated Michelson Morley's experiments on ether because. Um, you know, we had a fantastic uh, physics teacher. He uh, inculcated us in a, in a huge sense of curiosity about uh, learning and about discovery. He never took a lecture except uh, to demonstrate an experiment. He would put great trouble to demonstrate an experiment. And then he would make us derive the, the scientific principle. He would say this experiment was done you know, 500 years ago or 800 years ago and this is the person who did it. And what do you think he understood from this? So we learned about science as a wonderful journey. And um, you know, I, I can still picture each of those experiments. 
I remember he asked us, how do you think they're going to get semi-silver mirrors? And uh, after a lot of thought, mostly prodded uh, by him, uh, we worked out that if we took a sheet of uh, metal, uh, foil, metal foil, and cut little windows on it, the entire parts would reflect and the parts that had holes would actually allow uh, light or electromagnetic waves to go through. Uh, he was so uh, intelligent that he only got angry uh, if you did not take responsibility. So because we had all this linked up experimental sort of equipment in the physics lab, he only got cross with you if he came and told him that uh, father this broke. He would be livid. If you went and told the father, I'm sorry I broke this, no problem, you would say put 50 paise into this um, tin box. That 50 paise was for buying him a box of cigars at the end of the year. Uh, and uh, we, he would then tell you to stay back after class, and then he would of course have chocolate and milk and everything waiting for you because you'd be hungry after class. And he would help you to repair it, and then he would give you an, exp you know, an opportunity to make a transmitter or a receiver or a radio or a photoelectric relay or whatever. So, you know, breaking things wasn't a problem as long as you took responsibility for it and learned how to repair it. Um, there would be few schools in our land that would give us, you know, give a person this kind of an education. Our chemistry teacher was just as amazing. He he um, he wasn't a chemist actually. He he was um, from the IAS and he had retired. And he told us that all the discoveries were made by people who could see what others couldn't see. So he spent um, all of class 9 and class, class 10 just teaching us the art of observation. Uh, he would say take chemical A and say chemical B and uh, smell it, watch it, hear it, taste it. And uh, so uh, chemistry was a, again a, uh, you know, an ex a journey into trying to see, observe, hear, taste and um, because Jamshedpur was hugely resourced. We had the National Metallurgical Laboratory, so they had all these computerized systems where you put in a bit of soil and you tell you how much iron ore it has. And uh, we were amazed as medical students to learn, I mean, as school students to learn that there was more iron ore in the slag that was discarded by Tisco uh, than in the iron ore that the one steel started with in Japan. We were so rich as a country. Um, I said I wouldn't take a few minutes about school, but you can see that I really, really enjoyed my schooling and so it was in college. I came here. In grad school you could take either biology or maths and so I could do um, additional maths. I, I therefore felt slightly uneducated because I didn't know calculus. So when we were in the men's hostel, uh, I told my roommate Sudipta, I don't know if Sudipta is here, uh, but uh, Sudipta and I were great pals in, in, in uh, the men's hostel. So I told him, Sutta, will you please teach me calculus? So he, he said, sure. So Sudipta and Mukund, they both did. Mukund actually passed away in a terrible accident in our first year uh, during the picnic. But Sudipta and Mukund and Mr. Uh, Rose, our physics teacher, they uh, used to, all three of them were teachers for one student because one and one to learn calculus. Now, where in the world will you get a college where your mates will be willing to go out of their way and every week spend two hours after working hours, after dinner, in the physics lab to teach a, uh, a young uh, person a new subject? Um, and I could go on with many, many stories about all my classmates. Uh, we had a, a wonderful time and I really learned a huge amount from them. My teachers were exceptional people. There's so many of them and I, and I love them also dearly that I'm afraid that I forget uh, some names. But it's not because I don't care, but because uh, time is short. Um, but I you know, remember um, Dr. K.G. Koshi, he was a principal when I came. He was really gentle, he was professor of community health. His daughter Reno was in our class. And uh, uh, you know, we had to uh, go and meet him um, after the first term exams, I think this principal uh, still does that. Uh, all of you have to meet the first year students. Now, needless to say, we hadn't done very well uh, in our first term exams. Uh, what we were trying to learn how to serve and carry tables and everything else, and the joy of being in college. So, physics, chemistry, and uh, 
biology, you know, we got, you know, I, I forgot how much, but 60 or 65 marks or something. So he looked at it and he said, he looked at my, uh, very unfairly, at, at our, I said, at our ISC marks, which are, you know, grades, and so they uh, give you high grades. And he said, you used to get this, now you're only getting 60. Do you want me to write to your mother and father and, uh, and tell them that you're not studying? So I said, no, no, we will, we will work harder. And then the twinkle in his eye, he burst out laughing. He said, no, no, we were just uh, teasing you. Uh, we realize that uh, you know, you're, you're trying hard. Uh, enjoy yourself, he said. And uh, they served us uh, coffee or juice. And um, you know, we started to have a discussion about uh, new aspects of learning. So I was absolutely amazed that here was the principal, the vice principal, and the teachers having a discussion with us about uh, how can, how does one learn, and what are the ways in which we can uh, improve the teaching and learning environment in, in CFC. Um, subsequently, my principals were Dr. Joe and Dr. Fed. Uh, Dr. Joe, of course, was a was a wonderful scientist. I remember him taking me to the first electron microscope that we had in our institution. It was where medical records is now. And you can imagine the tingle of delight and uh, anticipation that we had when we were shown uh, the microstructure of cells in an electron microscope. Uh, so in addition to being the principal, uh, he also was a wonderful scientist. Now in addition to that, he also taught me how to make coffee for 1,000 people. Because he and Dr. Salupanti, who later on was my teacher in orthopedics, they were sort of the uh, leaders in St. John's Church. And you know that for Easter and for <coughs> harvest, you have to make uh, food for large numbers of people. So we were always in charge of, uh, of making the, the coffee. And Dr. Joe and Dr. Salupanti would tease me because I could never light the fire with one matchstick because you know, I was supposed to be a boy scout and we learned how to to light this fire with us, uh, with one match. So after I had failed this video, they would laugh, and then they would you know, collect all the leaves together, start the fire, make the coffee. And uh, I, can, I can still picture uh, you know, them tasting it and adding some more sugar, adding some more coffee powder. Um, Dr. Fenn was the next principal. Dr. Fenn was, again, an amazing person. Uh, he, he, uh, we were his family, so he would wander into our rooms and check out on us. And uh, during the strike, uh, we actually, we students took out a procession because Dr. Nakai had been in prison. And uh, Sulika was uh, president, I think, and I was general secretary. And so we had to, uh, we had to sh show our solidarity with our teacher. So we decided to take a, a procession. So Dr. Fenn, uh, although it was supposed to be a student's procession, he had his car at the back with water, lime juice, uh, to make sure that any student who was tired and who, who was like to faint could be hustled into the car and rescued before we got to the electric. I remember the great mastery of the subjects that our teachers had. I remember, you know, struggling with, uh, with I think it was hematemesis. Um, and uh, so I don't know if I'm, you know, there's this huge long list of conditions that I have to try and remember when somebody comes with vomiting uh, in the casualty. How, how do I cope? So he told me, it's, it's not this long list, you've got it all wrong. You only have to remember three things. You put your hand in the epigastrium and if there's a mass, then it's CA stomach. You put a hand the right uh, hypochondrium, and uh, uh, you know, if there's a mass, it's a spleen, and it must be cirrhosis of the liver. You can't get a mass in either of these places, of these places you should just check on the right side, and if, uh, if there's tenderness there, it's a glutal ulcer. There's only three things that you have to remember. The rest is all gas. And, <laughs> and uh, you know, surgeons and gas have a separate, special relationship. So, so I, I, and I can still remember that. I still remember that with such clarity. Um, you know, they, they, the, the, our teachers were, were giants, and they were able to show us that uh, true learning uh, is actually gaining insights and not getting confused with lots of details. Um, can I please go on for five or ten minutes more? I, I'm actually only in the first part of my talk, but I'll, I'll stop because we all have to get on with our lives. Um, but, you know, I, I, in addition to uh, learning from my colleagues and from my teachers, um, 
I learned a huge amount uh, from living in the men's hostel. The men's hostel was always a very special place. Uh, we were expected to govern it, to lay down the rules, and to ensure that democracy, fairness, and good fun was all mixed up and enjoyed. Um, I can remember that you know, we were, I was handed the speaker's file, and to my astonishment, I found that Dr. Ramesh Patwarda, uh, Ramesh must have been about 10 years senior to me, uh, when the men's hostel had had a, you know, a, a night long debate about what is a point of order, do you know what he did? He wrote to the speaker of the Lok Sabha, and the speaker of the Lok Sabha actually sent him a reply and a code of conduct for the entire uh, Lok Sabha proceedings and explained what is the difference between a point of clarification and a point of order. And, um, you know, this was the kind of attention to detail and the kind of care that I experienced here. Here was, you know, a, a speaker of a small uh, hostel of a small college, miles away from Delhi. But when he wrote to the speaker of our parliament, he had the time to not only craft a brilliant reply, but also send in the details. Um, I know that you know, we struggle with things like running the mess, um, and but you know we possibly learned as much in, in, in learning in running the mess about health economics and about nutrition as we did in the classroom. And um, we you know acted in plays, um, debated very hotly about uh, what good education was. Uh, I can remember Dr. Nandakumar Menon, which many, who many of you know, he was the first curriculum secretary. We had a curriculum uh, seminar and discussed with our teachers. Uh, and the love and the affection and the openness which they showed us is something that I, you know, had a huge influence in my life. So, in addition, of course, to the, the men's hostel, the college, and the students and the faculty that I learned from, I learned a huge amount from the head of chaplaincy, the head of AC Poon. Uh, Archan is the one who reminded us and showed us that uh, you know that the invisible is can be made visible if we will only take the trouble to look, to feel, to touch. Um, every Independence Day and Republic Day, he would take us to some person who needed a houseboat. Uh, we were no engineers, uh, we had no building skills, but we had great fun trampling on the mud to soften it and lining the brick, but, uh, from, uh, putting all the bricks in place and putting up the, the walls of these houses. Once it was for the watchman of the auditorium whose house had been burnt in a communal uh, riot, once it was uh, the house of the person who was a beggar in our campus. Who I told him that you only made a house for the other person, one for me. So the next person we went, uh, the next time we went there. I've accompanied him to uh, the burning, uh, the, 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 cemetery, the cemetery and the burning ground on the banks of the Pala. When I remember there was a patient who uh, was uh, from West Bengal and uh, they were both college professors. Uh, the lady's husband had died, and she wanted me to do the last rites. And of course, I was horrified because I had never seen it being done. But she said, No, you are a Bhattacharya, so you must, be, uh, you, you must have it in you, so you have to do it. So, guided by Reverend A.C. Kuman, we, we just followed her instructions. We both you know, carried out those last rites, and with tears in our eyes, we hugged each other and did our best. But here was um, a chaplain who had such a deep influence uh, on us. Partly, of course, because he had he knew Gandhiji, he had been to the to uh, the border when India was divided between Pakistan and uh, had been had experienced all the horror of partition and the, and the killing of people. So he also had this marvelous wit and this great ability to debate and discern and help us to see the truth. We were members of SCMs and EUs, uh, we had class prayers, but most of all, through the example of the race movement and our teachers and our seniors and our juniors, I discovered 
that um, I have not come maybe to a college to get a degree in medicine, but I have come to learn about life. And I learned about life in all its fullness. Because there is no time, I'm just going to uh, I'll try to explain to you where I learned and how I learned to love. I shall just very briefly explain to you uh, how I came to understand uh, about learning to learn. learn. But I want to tell you about uh, a favorite teacher of mine and a friend. His name was Dr. Philip Gorman. Um, Philip was uh, our teacher in operative surgery. Um, he, when we were primary, he used to come to the uh, anatomy department and he taught us operative surgery. He used to come on a scooter and I used to absolutely marvel at how his hand would glide uh, over the skin, subcutaneous tissue, and you know, reveal all the, 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 the procedures, the uh, organs to us in wonderful detail. Because you know, I really enjoyed anatomy and uh, loved dissection, but I wasn't so dumb that I couldn't make out the difference between my scratching and Philip's artistry. Uh, I then uh, went on to go to orthopedics and as uh, Alki said, I uh, was asked by Dr. P. Zachariah when I was doing my time uh, at the Missionaries of Charity if I would come and do rehab. And I it was very ungracious about it. I didn't say, I said I don't know, I have to wait because I was very anxious that I wouldn't, I wouldn't be able to uh, do a good job of rehab because I didn't know what it was. But Paul Brand suggested I do orthopedics, so I did that. But after finishing orthopedics, I realized that if I didn't do plastic surgery, I wouldn't be able to handle the pressure source. So, although I was being paid for by PMR, CMC very graciously allowed me to work in plastic surgery. And uh, I kept praying and hoping that they would find somebody else to do PMR so I could continue to be in plastic surgery because I, I enjoyed it so much. Philip was an absolutely marvelous person. He he was marvelous because not only he had a wonderful intellect, but he was an artist, he was a poet. As you heard, he is the author of the, of the computer system in our, uh, in our institution. I was just his friend and I used to wander around with him, but I didn't have any of that, that which it takes to do that work. It was he who, who did it. Um, I, I learned a huge amount from him, but I will just tell you three Three things that he, he taught me uh, in the interest of time. The first, he taught, first thing that he taught me was that there's always another way. He had a quote, oh, there's always a better way, excuse me. Uh, there's always a better way. He had a lovely poster. Uh, I want to paint that with words for you. Uh, it was a blue sea with a blue sky. Uh, it was not easy to make out where the sky ended and the sea began, or where the sea ended and the sky began. And on this, uh, See, there were three turtles. It was Daddy Turtle you know, uh, swimming and Mommy Turtle swimming. And they were both had their necks turned to 180 degrees to look askance at uh, the little turtle. The little turtle wasn't swimming like Mommy and Daddy. He had his shell upside down and he was rolling. Okay, so can you picture it? The, the, the turtle and his shell on the sea. Rowing, uh, rowing, and uh, you can see that mommy and daddy didn't improve, but you can see that there's always a better way. Uh, the second thing that I learned from Philip uh, is that uh, five loaves and two fish, um, it's never enough until you start getting it away. Uh, and I learned this not only because he said this, but because he actually practiced it. In, in a zillion ways. Um, and the, the third thing that I learned from him, of course, is you're only as rich as what you can give away. So you're not as rich as what you have, but you're only as rich as what you can give away. Now let me tell you a few experiences I had which makes me remember these with such clarity. Um, plastic surgery in those days was a really poor department. We had lots of patients with births, and you know the treatment of patients with births is very expensive. The first 48 hours, all the IV fluids, the plasma they have to give, uh, in a sense, the bit soaring. And um, so, but we had policy that we would, as long as we had beds, we would not deny treatment. And we would try to 
say when we come across the case to us and we do the right At this time, microsurgery was uh, just coming in. We, of course, were, uh, didn't have the money to, to buy a microscope. So Philip decided that we'd make one. Uh, his son, Mona, had, uh, was in high school. We bought his physics books and uh, looked up the, the, you know, the details about the optics of how to make a zoom. We uh, managed to convince our friends in ophthalmology to grind the lenses for us. And we went to the uh, long bazaar and you know, tried to get the, the tinkers to make tubes that would actually uh, glide within each other. Because they were, you know, they didn't want to see us because we keep saying, you know, change this, make a uh, groove here, make a cut here. So they would tell us what to develop on a So that became a little, a little ditty between Philip and me, uh, which was means that you don't want to do this bit work. Uh, please get us some proper work so we can earn some money. But we persisted and uh, we, we made the zoom. Of course, we then found out about coating of lenses and realized that we were losing lots of light. Uh, at the surface because we had all these lenses and at each, at each surface we were losing lenses. We tried to read up about how we could coat lenses but we were a bit flat -hops. And so we just decided to increase the amount of light so we could still have uh, uh, enough light despite having this low cost uh, zoom. Now, why did Philip want to make a microscope? Because his assistant Swanton had only monocular vision because we were using the ENT microscopes. So he would tell me, Swan, now cut the suture. And I would every time you know, try and cut the, the anastomosis. And he would kick me on the table and say, hey, hey, hey. And, but that, you know, I didn't have uh, uh, binocular vision. So he said, look, let's correct this. So we designed this microscope. And uh, we you know, didn't have proper money for, for instruments. So we went to the jewelers, uh, uh, the, the watch repairs, and bought the jewelers fossils from there for five rupees each. Um, and we rigged up lots of other uh, equipment for this microsurgery. And just at that time, a, a person walked into plastic surgery and said, you know, I've heard that you have uh, designed a microscope. Um, we are from Machiki Patna. So he said, yes. He said, uh, see, in Machiki Patna, there is a defense factory which makes rifle sights. Uh, so, because the main rifle sites, of course, they are uh, good with optics. And uh, uh, so, we want to, we've been asked to make an optic microscope. So, if you will give us your design, we will make it for you. We were, of course, over the moon. And we handed him all the papers, and then we made the microscope and brought it back. So, on the day they brought it back, they said, We brought the microscope to show you. And of course, uh, we uh, saw it, and it was absolutely fabulous. Um, didn't look at all as snazzy as the one, say, in neurosurgery or uh, EMT, uh, who were you know, much, who had lots of uh, equipment and wonderful microscopes. But this was one that we had made. So now the manufacturers asked us the magic question. They asked us, how much do you think it should cost? So Philip said, so I said, just check how much money we have in our special fund. We have 30,000 rupees. We told him, this microscope should cost 30,000 rupees. Done, he said. So we, we had our first microscope for exactly the right amount of money that we had in our special funds. And so this is what he meant when he said that five loaves and two fish, uh, it's never enough when you start giving it away. Uh, the more we gave away, the more resources we had. Um, Philip uh, was also a deeply spiritual person. And the conversations that I've had with him about God, about reality, about compassion, about excellence, about uh, what is the purpose of our lives and what does God want us to do, are conversations that are seared in my memory and I shall never forget them. I learned as much from Philip as I had from any other teacher in my life. And on this special day, I want to specially remember him. Um, my list is long. I learned from from people within CMC and outside CMC, like Nikkei City and, um, uh, and uh, um, Mother Teresa. I learned from my patients. Um, why he is uh, standing outside, he is from Indian Institute of uh, Management. He's standing in his wheelchair, of course. Uh, but I learned as much from him as I have from anyone else. 
from Dagunai to a person who, uh, despite his parentage, would go farming, chase his cows and buffaloes in the field, harvest his sugarcane. I've learned from Suresh, an artist with severe muscular dystrophy who can only move a few fingers. I've learned from other departments, from psychiatry, from commentary, LCC, neurological sciences, orthopedics, hand surgery. The list is endless. Um, you know, in our department, we have a huge number of uh, professionals. Um, so we have wonderful nurses, physiotherapists, occupational therapists, prosthetic and ontology people, speech therapists, psychologists, social workers, artists. And you know, from each of these, I've learned so much. Um, I, and I've enjoyed it all enormously. Um, that I feel that I'm not really 60, but I'm actually 16. And that I'm on the edge of this portion of knowledge. And there's so much more uh, to learn, and I'm so grateful uh, for all the opportunities that I had. Um, my colleagues, George, Rajiv, Judy, and um, Suresh, and Rasdi, and many, many others, uh, I'm deeply grateful to each one of them. They have made my professional life so exciting that um, you know, I can keep speaking for many, many more hours and sharing endless anecdotes with you about how much I owe this place and how much I have done it. So this is the college of my dreams because I came here uh, to learn and I realized that what I came to learn was how to learn. And I came here not recognizing that what I really need to do was to learn to love. And both they are taught to me. I just want to end by reading a quotation uh, or a poem that um, it's called A Creed for the Disabled. I know many of you know it. It's also entitled The Prayer of an Unknown Confederate Soldier. Um, I'm not sure uh, by whom it was written and which year, but the words are endless and are very true for me. I asked God for strength that I might achieve. I was made, I was made weak that I might learn humbly to obey. I asked for health that I might do greater things, that was given in poverty that I might do better things. I asked for riches that I might be happy, I was given poverty that I might be wise. I asked for power that I might have the praise of men, I was given weakness that I might feel the need of God. I asked for all things that I might enjoy life, I was given life that I might enjoy all things. I got nothing that I asked for but everything I had hoped for. Almost despite myself, my unspoken prayers were answered. I am among all men most rich.